Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, June 2010 uh, meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society Ottawa Centre. Uh, we've got a fairly full program for you tonight. Uh, there's been some very interesting developments in news over the last little while. Uh, could you flip forward, please? Okay, uh, we've got our uh, usual program of uh, regular presentations, uh, starting off with Tim Cole doing Ottawa Skies tonight. Uh, Richard Alexandrovich, uh, talk on uh, a galactic imposter. Al with our uh, astronomy news. Tim with a bit of an introduction to Sky Tools 3. Uh, those of you who were here last month will recall that we're organizing a group buy of Sky Tools 3. So uh, I think Tim is going to show us some of the major features and effervesce about how well it works. Uh, after the break, uh, Bart Tector is going to talk to us about his mobile observatory. Murray is going to get up and talk to us about an observing session he had recently. Uh, we'll have our usual observations. We have a, a good set of observations to show you this month. Uh, Paul, whose name somehow didn't end up on there, is doing our Deep Sky Challenge, and Brian McCullough will be talking to you about the Lunar Challenge. So without uh, any further ado, uh, here's Tim with your astronomy, or pardon me, with your Ottawa skies. It works. Left, right, right. Oh, yeah, right. Seasonal constellations for June. Um, as you can see here, we're losing the Leo hour. We've still got Mars, but not for much longer, and certainly not much larger. Saturn still is a lovely little knock your eyes out gem for the next little while. So uh, basically, this is pretty much your uh, upcoming sky. The whole killer you've got with June is that it gets dark so late, or it gets late very early, or early, never mind, forget it. So there's the planet summary. Mercury, uh, we've got back again. Um, Venus is actually hitting its highest altitude this year, so here's a great opportunity. Unfortunately, it's mostly gibbous. So it's kind of the least interesting phase, but oh well, what the heck. It's still fun. So that's basically the rundown. And uh, courtesy Chris, uh, we'll give you a little crack at finding uh, Uranus. The moon and Jupiter, uh, nothing special, just a nice pretty Kodak moment coming up uh, tomorrow. Lots of fun. I think the big fun with that is that Jupiter's making its return, and we've got some interesting stuff on Jupiter coming up, some of which you can actually see, like it's lost its belt. So it's south equatorial pants are full. Never mind, be quiet, Tim. Um, so here we have Jupiter. And courtesy Chris, you can see Uranus right there. Actually, no, you can't because, anyway, never mind. Um, Mars and Regulus. Mars has been just trekking along the sky lately, so even though it's small and dinky, it is kind of fun. Um, there's a Telrad reticle there for reference. So um, again, on the 6th, very, very soon. And of course, it's cloudy all weekend. Uh, you know the definition of a Monday, right? First nice day after two days of rain? Anyway, um, yeah. Uh, it's. Yeah, that's the one. So there's Mars making a very close approach to Regulus, and who cares, because we aren't going to get to see any of it anyway. Um, so here we have Mars making a nice little trot across the sky. So it's, it's still really zipping along quite a lot. Um, if you happen to be an astrodynamics nut, um, Mars is kind of a fun thing to observe simply for its, its wild motions. Not as wild as Venus, but it's, it's still a lot of fun. Venus and the twins, speaking of Venus. Again, nothing really spectacular, but a pretty Kodak moment. Um, coming up. Just fun, enjoyable stuff eh, for your backyard. There you go. Aren't you thrilled? Um, <laughs> the Backyard Deep Sky, Alexi M101. Um, I have actually caught it from my miserably light polluted backyard. Um, so what the heck, it's worth a shot. Um, it's a faint fuzzy, and I'm not a big faint fuzzy guy. In case you don't know what I mean by faint fuzzy, it's something that you see through an eyepiece and say, yeah, it's a little fuzzy thing, ain't that cool? Um, half the fun with it is knowing what you looked at. Uh, the trick with M101, at least it works for me, is you've got an almost equilateral triangle forming out of the last two stars in the, um, the, the handle of the Big Dipper. So it makes it a reasonably easy thing to star hop to. There we go. There's a nice little amateur shot. And uh, binocular treat is the coat hanger. The coat hanger is a fun little thing. It's not a cluster, actually, even though there's been lots of argument. The last uh, rendering on it is it's not a cluster. It's an accidental arrangement. But it's there sort of partway along the lines of the southern uh, of the summer triangle. And there we have a nice little amateur shot. And Chris thoughtfully added the outline of the coat hanger. 
which I didn't bother because I thought it was obvious. Um, but I, I guess it wasn't. So anyway, that's a really fun one with um, uh, binoculars, and it's really easy to find once you've found Elberio. While we're in that area, as I mentioned, we've got some really beautiful little double stars, which I find are really fun from the burbs because it's stuff you can still see in a heavily light polluted sky. The infamous uh, Tim Horton star up there. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the one, that, the double double. Um, and actually, it's kind of fun because uh, it, it, as the conditions get better and whatnot, you can actually resolve more and more of it. So that, that's kind of a fun thing to enjoy. And then Alberio, which in my humble opinion is probably one of the most gorgeous uh, doubles in the sky. And then finally, the famous Ring Nebula. Back up, you twit. Um, yes, the other, there we go. M57, the Ring Nebula, uh, and also a nice little backyard treat. But of course, the darker the sky, the better the picture of the Ring Nebula. And I didn't put up a picture of it because everybody's seen a picture of it. And if you haven't seen a picture of it, this is a good reason to go look for it because it's really easy to find it. So um, there you go. And here is the actual Ottawa sky for June. Um, <laughs> Always enjoy Tim's presentations. Next up, Richard Alexandrovich. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to make some fun about the uh, northern sky, or put a little trouble there for viewers in the northern sky and concentrate on the southern hemisphere tonight. Uh, I know some people might say, well, because we're in the northern hemisphere, the northern skies are much better than the south. But you know, realistically, I think the southern skies are more glamour and glo glory down down there. So anyway, if um, time and opportunity knocks, and if you got some cash on the side uh, to explore the southern southern skies, then by all means, grab it, take the opportunity. Um, those living in places such as Australia, uh, Chile, and as far north as Mexico do have their share of visual treats as well, so you don't really have to go too far south. The uh, northern hemisphere seems to pale in contrast when uh, placed side by side with objects in the south. And one such object uh, is NGC 5139, or better known as the glorious Omega Centauri globular cluster. It's a class 8 globular cluster. And this one here, it's an image taken with a 14-inch uh, reflector. And you can see it's sort of, uh, well, as I said before, pales in contrast to the best one in the Northern Hemisphere. That's uh, the great cluster in M13 and Hercules. It's the biggest and brightest in the entire sky and as well as in the Milky Way. The only larger one, as far as the uh, local group is concerned, is Mayall 2 in M31. It is both brighter and more massive as well. Omega Sen may be a remnant of a cannibalized dwarf spheroidal galaxy, which I will discuss uh, shortly. Now, what about Omega as an object? Um, as a globular, it differs from an open cluster, such as the, uh, uh, this one here, M103, the Pleiades or the Hyades. As you can see, the stars are loosely congregated in this image here. Um, just to briefly go over uh, Astronomy 101, what is an open cluster? It's basically a loose collection of dozens to hundreds of young stars that is uh, residing in the spiral arms of our Milky Way uh, galaxy. They are weakly held together by the forces of gravity and as a consequence uh, begin to disperse after a few hundred million years. Typically, their distances are much closer, ranging from several hundred light years to thousands of light years, at least those that are visible in the backyard telescopes. Now, our sun, as a matter of fact, is a member of one such open cluster called the Ursa Major Moving Cluster, which includes, I think, such stars as Sirius and Regulus in Leo. Now, what about globulars? Now, we're going, we're going to jump here a little bit. Their place of residence is either in the galactic halo in the central part of our Milky Way, in the central bulge, and uh, also in the halo of our galaxy as well. The population of stellar members uh, is from anywhere from tens of thousands to as many as a few million. There, they are bound tightly by gravity, and they last for billions of years, some being almost as old as the universe itself. Distances are far greater, and that's on the average, that's tens of thousands of light years away. Therefore, they're quite, quite a bit fainter when you look through the eyepiece. 
Historically, about 2,000 years ago, um, Omega was listed in Ptolemy's catalog as a star, and I find that a little bit surprising because today in the southern hemisphere you could see it as a nebulous patch of sky, of, 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 of an object in the sky. So in those pristine skies 2,000 years ago, I wonder why they just saw it as a star. That's a, that's a, that's a bit of a mystery. It was officially discovered by Edmund Haley in 1677, who thought it resembled a nebula although it wasn't. Then in 1830, uh, John William Herschel, an English astronomer, recognized it as a, a true globular. Uh, all globulars look impressive in the eyepiece, but Omega uh, lies in a class by itself. Now I call this the uh, looking at Christmas lights through a blinding snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, I love this picture. Um, actually, not like the lights in front of our house, but almost. At a distance of about 15,800 light years, it has a mass of about 5 million suns packed in a sphere um, about 230 light years wide. Now here you have the, um, just to give you a rough size, uh, 26 arc seconds, which is equivalent to 2 light years or 0.61 of a parsec. You could see all the stars packed in, in this small area. Um, that's only the very central bulge of Omega. Here you've got the red giants. These are the orange stars over here. And these are what they call blue stragglers, which I'll get to shortly. And all these sort of off-white cream-colored stars are sun-like stars, much like our sun. And of course, uh, probably you guessed it by now, these tiny red ones are the red dwarfs. So as you can see, you've got every imaginable stellar chemistry star type in that particular globular. And for, as a matter of fact, and probably many other globulars, which we think is probably the remnants of a core of a small galaxy, and you're just looking inside the core of this particular uh, old galaxy. Um, now, it, the um, globular is about 10 times more massive than your average globular and it may have as many as anywhere between 9 to 10 million suns, uh, stars. In our solar neighborhood, the nearest star lies about 4.2 light years away. That's Proxima Centauri, also in Centaurus as well. And stars near the core are separated by only 0.1 light years. That is stars here in, in Omega. So if there are inhabitants in that area, revolving uh, in planets, revolving about their stars, interstellar travel would be really a cinch. Stars ablaze will be in the night sky. In other words, if you're on a planet, then of course there'd be tons of stars in the night sky, much like Sirius or the brightest stars in our skies. And of course, they'd be so bright that they would cast shadows upon the ground. And unfortunately, deep sky viewing would be probably next to impossible. There are several aspects about Omega that make it stand out from about the 200 or so other globulars in our Milky Way galaxy. And first of all, it rotates faster than your average typical globular. It has a highly flattened or oval shape, and it has at least two generations of stars, not one which is normal for most globulars. And finally, astronomers suspect that a massive object, most likely a 40,000 solar mass black hole, lurks within the core of this globular. That is why we require the full power of professional scopes to uncover the secrets of Omega. There's another image, an earlier HSD image of the uh, globular. Um, the distance, oops, how do we go back to the other one, I guess? Oh, okay, thanks. The, um, the distance um, across the image is about 10 light years, and there you have about 30,000 stars from one, ed, uh, from one part uh, here, from here to the other. And, um, but in our part of the galaxy, if you would take the same area, let's say Hubble would take another picture, you'd get maybe at the most five or six stars. Um, Omega is indeed, as I said, an ancient globular probably about 12 billion years old. Recent studies may put Omega into a new class of deep sky object, which is now coming into the forefront. What we may be seeing are the remnants of a smaller galaxy, a smaller spheroidal galaxy that was cannibalized by our Milky Way millions of years ago. Now, there are other examples involving um, cannibalism between our Milky Way and other smaller members, and I'll give you one example here. One of them includes the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, or SDG, which is more familiar to us as M54. Oops. 
There's a black and white image, and that is uh, an amoeba-like outline of M54, or the, um, the galaxy that was consumed roughly in that area of where it is seen. You, you can't really see the shape. You'll see the globular M54. That's no problem. But the shape of the galaxy, you need uh, infrared uh, telescopes to see through that. And then, of course, there is the De Canis Major dwarf galaxy and Mayall II, which is found in the Andromeda galaxy. And similar to the food chain, here we are making similarities that where larger species prey upon the smaller ones. And in astronomy, this is part of the galactic hierarchy process. Omega stellar chemistry and motion in the galaxy also suggest that it may be the core of a dwarf member. Uh, back about 11 years ago, in 1999, astronomers at Yonsei University in South Korea created a CMD diagram, a color magnitude diagram, for 50,000 stars in the uh, globular using a one meter telescope in Chile. So what did they find? The stars did not all form at once, but in fact in two separate time periods. The time periods were separated by at least one billion years. Another example is in Tirzon 5, which is at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, another glo globular where there are two populations of stars, um, one about uh, 12 billion years and the other about 6 billion years. So there again, that could be also uh, the remnants of a dwarf galaxy. Also, the stellar chemistry is not mainly hydrogen or helium, but heavier metals. Metals formed out of different clouds of gas, which is unusual for a true globular. There is a diagram of the stars in uh, Omega Centauri. You can see that roughly they're about the same. Oops, I keep pressing the wrong one here. There we go. They're roughly the same, but you can see there are small differences between the, I, I used red and blue to differentiate the two stellar populations of one star and uh, one group of stars and the other. And of course you have your um, um, iron abundances here and calcium showing along the electromagnetic spectrum the different, uh, different wavelengths that these stars come. So there are distinctly two populations of stars within that particular uh, globular. That's just a simplified diagram. Another aspect about omega that is odd and doesn't seem to fit the chemistry of a true globular is something else um, that they found in images obtained from the um, Advanced Camera for Surveys, or ACS, on board the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and data collected by a spectrograph on the Gemini South Telescope in Chile. It shows that the globular appears to harbor an intermediate mass black hole, about 40,000 solar masses. The green lines around there, uh, showing like an atom-like structure, are the stars that are whizzing around that massive object at the center of Omega. As mentioned earlier, Omega is 10 times as massive as other large globulars, almost as massive as a small galaxy. So there we start getting a picture here. Today we're armed with the knowledge that uh, most galaxies appear to har harbor a black hole. Omega harbors an intermediate mass black hole, or an ISMH. Astronomer Eva Noyola and her colleagues used the uh, Hubble Space Telescope and the Gemini South Scope to record motions and luminosities of stars at the heart of Omega. And this is how they do it. Um, this is actually for a globular cluster M15 and uh, G1, which is, I believe, in Andromeda as well. Uh, when you're looking at it, uh, this is the, um, um, the, spec the uh, spectrum of, the, of each star. When you have a stationary star, the Balmer lines tend to stay put in one in their respective locations. But when the star is receding, the Balmer lines start going toward the uh, red end of the spectrum, or redshift, and of course, uh, blue end of the spectrum uh, when they're uh, coming, approaching uh, Earth or closer to our, our, our vantage point. If the stars are all a collection of stars, then the fingerprints of stars are smeared, so you get this kind of fuzzy uh, appearance, such as in globular cluster uh, G1 in Andromeda. So the non-luminous matter that they are looking at in Omega is about 40,000 solar masses. Um, according to Noyola, uh, this is a quote that if scientists could prove that such an object does exist here, it could have profound implications for the past history of the globular. Um, if this is an intermediate mass black hole, then astronomers may come across many more of them by looking deep into the heart of these globulars. 
The one in Omega may be a baby supermassive black hole that may provide the seeds to become a supermassive black hole that is found in the heart of galaxies. Uh, a final word regarding stellar types and populations. This is Omega looking in two types of light, visible light on the left and ultraviolet in, on the right. As you can see, the more impressive picture is, invisible, is the visible part, which tells us that the uh, stars are cooler and there are many more, which uh, also lets us know that the globular is older. In the ultraviolet, there are less stars, not as impressive, showing that the hotter, or brighter stars are not as numerous, meaning um, that there are only, there are less stars that are in that range, in that classification. And a lot of these objects here, like the bright dots here, they might not even be related to Omega. They might be in the background telling us that's probably a supernova remnant or supernova explosion. So if you discount all these bright objects and just concentrate on these, there's not very many stars compared to the warmer, uh, war uh, cooler, I should say, uh, redder stars that the cluster is mostly made up of. Richard, are we looking at the same view in both pictures? Uh, yeah, same, same view, yeah, but taken in different, uh, different uh, okay. filters, same time, same time period. Um, remember that the uh, blue stars that you saw in the image earlier, well, these are what astronomers call uh, blue stragglers. These are older stars that are formed by either one of two ways. We could actually go into a topic of blue stragglers, but we'll just briefly go into it here because Omega, a lot of, some of the stars, I should say, are, are mainly the blue stragglers. They're not blue uh, supergiants. Don't get mixed up between the two. The first model, uh, first uh, method of uh, forming them is the collision model, which, in which two low mass stars rotate and eventually merge. Then as a byproduct, you get a hot, massive, rapidly rotating star. The star heats up and becomes the bloated red giant. Finally, the bloated red giant shrinks and in doing so heats up and becomes a slow spinning blue straggler. The other model, the other uh, method of forming is the slow coalescence model, where two rapidly rotating stars merge to form one massive star. The more massive of the two cannibalizes the partner, yielding a very uh, single very massive star. And the super heavyweight star morphs into a rapidly spinning blue straggler. Now about observing Omega. If someone tells you that one has to travel to the southern hemisphere to see this globular, well in short the answer is both true and false. Yes, you can see Omega in all her glory from southern latitudes, but the, and the views there are staggering, not compared to here in southern Canada. But Omega does have her throng of followers right here in Canada as well. Every year die-hard observers pack their scopes and gear and travel south, down to Point Pilly Park in southern Ontario, the southernmost point in Canada. Now, if you can, let me see, if you can cope with the uh, light domes of uh, Sandusky and Cleveland, Ohio, you're okay. This place um, on the north shore of beautiful western Lake Erie, straddling the 42nd parallel, Point Pili, Pili National Park, is the choice of observing connoisseurs alike who desire to take in the sights of the southern sky. Rising at a breathtaking 1.5 degrees above the horizon, and there is Omega right there. <laughs> that is your, um, your horizon right there. It's a watery horizon, so it's not really that bad at all. I did the, um, the blue part of the constellation for the stuff that is below Lake Erie or invisible, and the red part is all that you can see in southern Ontario. So um, it glows at about a magnitude 6.3, uh, but uh, down in the southern skies, I think it's about 3.4, like the Andromeda galaxy, so it's quite a lot brighter. So um, uh, it barely skims above the watery horizon, and the atmosphere will also play havoc with the object as well. Even if the surrounding air is transparent and steady, your image of NGC 5139 or Omega Centauri will be fair at best. Depending on observing conditions and scope, a six inch will be adequate. And that is the close-up of um, the area. And I think I'm going to click one more time here. As you can see right here, there's the horizon right there. So it just barely skims the water, and it, it lasts uh, for about um, 20, 15, 20 minutes of, uh, of thrill and of excitement. And then it sort of uh, goes over down <laughs> below the horizon. So there you go. 
I don't know if it's really worth traveling uh, 600 miles down there. Now, um, let's see, anything else here? Oh, well, Omega does have an allure all, all her own, but the remains, it is the remains of an ancient galaxy that hosts stars of every imaginable type and a black hole to cap it off. Making the trip down to glimpse 40 minutes of this cluster, of this cluster would well be the worth, will well be worth it, I think. And that is the um, sandbar, I guess, where if you can, if you have a small telescope, you can go out, and that's about as far as you can go before you reach uh, uh, Ohio. So um, I guess that that's about it. That wraps it up. Next up, uh, we have Al Scott to bring you all that's new in astronomy. Thank you, Al. Good evening, everybody. So uh, first up, I think we've got uh, some relatively new breaking news, uh, courtesy of Chris. Uh, this was uh, June 3rd uh, from Australia. This is an image of Jupiter. I think we've got a movie. Just watch near the arrow. Amateur video of Jupiter. And something should appear right there. So we've got one other one. There's two independent discoveries of this uh, impact on Jupiter on June 3rd. One from Australia, one from the Philippines here. And there's a still image of it. So something hit Jupiter, a comet or an asteroid, similar to the uh, Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact uh, several years ago. Um, so now astronomers are looking to see if they can see the debris left over from this uh, collision because after Shoemaker-Levy 9 there's big black debris clouds that dispersed from those uh, impact zones. Uh, so far nothing has been seen. Uh, it's been a day now since the impact. Uh, so maybe this wasn't as big as the other comet and didn't dredge up as much, as much material, but this is quite an, a neat uh, breaking news discovery. Thanks, Chris. By an amateur, by two amateurs. Alfred? Yeah? Um, what would cause the light? Uh, the comet vaporizing as it comes into the atmosphere, oh, okay. just the, the explosions. A lot of energy will be released and, and plasma will be created in the explosion. Yeah, the, there's been some interesting changes on Jupiter. There used to be a, a belt somewhere near the equator there, and uh, it seems to have disappeared. <laughs> uh, so interesting times. Next, I've got a, a trailer to show you, and uh, hopefully we'll have some sound with that as well. Close your ears, maybe. <laughs> Construction is the premier telescope of the next decade. A next generation space telescope designed to cause yet another giant leap forward in our understanding of the cosmos. It will carry some of the most advanced technologies ever placed on an orbiting observatory. segments, 2.75 times the diameter of Hubble's primary mirror. Micro shutters, wavefront sensing and control subsystem, 12 by 18 meter, 5 layer captain based sun shield. The Webb Telescope, a revolutionary tool able to study every phase in the history of our universe. The Webb Telescope. The audio quality was a little bit bad. Um, so this is uh, released on the Northrop Grumman website there, the uh, prime contractors for NASA for the, the next big telescope, the James Webb. Um, interesting, there's uh, a Canadian component to that uh, right here in Ottawa. 
Uh, we're working on the, uh, the fine guidance sensor for that particular telescope. It's supposed to launch in 2014, go out to the L2 Lagrange point, uh, one and a half million uh, kilometers away, and uh, look for first light galaxies, basically the first galaxies after the Big Bang. Uh, and Canada is contributing two instruments, as I said, the fine guidance sensor and a tunable filter imager, both on the same instrument. Uh, it's a very challenging project. It's going to be uh, the big sun shields you saw in the picture. They're about the size of a tennis court, and they basically point towards the sun and keep the, the infrared di uh, mirror cold, and it actually will cool passively down to 30 degrees above absolute zero. So that's roughly, you know, minus... Uh, what is it, minus 100 and, or minus 200 and some degrees, uh, minus 240 degrees, sorry about that, drawing a blank. Uh, so and then what, the, think of building a telescope at room temperature, having it cool down that much after being launched on a rocket, uh, deploying robotically, unfolding its primary mirror, folding out its uh, secondary mirror, and then coming into focus at 30 Kelvin. Uh, to look at the uh, the edges of the observable universe. So that's the, the challenge ahead of us. Yeah, we'll go to the next one. Now. <clears throat> okay, now for some uh, more scientific news. Uh, there's some really neat pictures of uh, interacting galaxies there from the National Optical Observatory in Kitt Peak's 2.1 meter dish. Uh, this story uh, Data from an ongoing survey by NASA's SWIFT satellite have helped astronomers solve a decades-long mystery about why a small percentage of black holes emit vast amounts of energy. Uh, I'll thank Richard for describing the fact that most galaxies now are thought to harbor a, a supermassive black hole in their center. Well, only about 1% of supermassive black holes uh, emit big wads of energy and, are, and, and flare up the intense emission from galaxy centers or uh, nuclei arises near a supermassive black hole containing between a million and a billion times the sun's mass, so a little bit bigger than the one in, in uh, Omega Centauri. Giving off as much as 10 billion times the sun's energy, some of these active galactic nuclei, or AGN, are the most luminous objects in the universe. Uh, and a lot of this stuff we've learned about relatively recently. People had, had seen these distant objects uh, called quasars, uh, and looking at the redshift, they, they seem to be at the far edge of the galaxy. They seem to be beaming light at us from, from very far away. And in fact, we understand now these are supermassive black holes with gas and dust that are surrounding them and, and circling them at high, high speeds, approaching the speed of light as they get pulled into these black holes. The gas collides with other gas, and heats up. And so you have this disk of, of cool gas coming in towards the center of the black hole, moving faster and faster, speeding up, getting really hot, and then shooting off from the poles of the black hole in jets, because they can't go out from all the stuff coming in along the disk. It shoots out in the poles and these jets, and magnetic fields are all wound up in these things, and they accelerate particles off. And some of these galaxies have great long uh, jets extending thousands of kiloparsecs out into the interstellar intergalactic medium. Uh, and these are called quasars, and if the, if the jet is directed right straight towards us, it's extremely bright. It's called a blazar, actually. So, uh, not a vest, no. So, people know that thick clouds of dust and gas in these galaxies can surround the black hole, and it can block ultraviolet, it can block optical and low energy or, or soft X-ray light. Uh, infrared radiation from warm dust near the black hole can pass through the material, but it can often be confused with emissions from the galaxy's uh, star-forming regions, especially near the center of a, of a galaxy. Hard X-rays that are observed by the Swift telescope, or high-energy X-rays, and can help scientists directly detect the energetic black hole. And that's what the Swift telescope has been doing. Now, the violence involved in galactic mergers, each galaxy has dust lanes and gas clouds that orbit nicely and sedate orbits around the center of the galaxies. But imagine when two galaxies come together orbiting in different directions. The gas clouds collide, they lose their angular momentum, and they funnel down into the middle of the galaxy where these supermassive black holes are, are sitting. 
And what happens then is the galaxy black hole starts feeding on this and the jets appear and, and they light up and they start emitting huge amounts of energy. Well, until Swift's hard X-ray survey, astronomers never could be sure that they'd counted the majority of AGNs. They weren't sure they were getting a good statistics on these things. Uh, so since its launch in 2004, the Burst Alert Telescope aboard Swift has been mapping the sky using hard X-rays. The survey, which is sensitive to AGN as far as 650 million light years away, so in the, in the relatively nearby universe, not towards the edges of the universe, uncovered dozens of previously unrecognized active galactic nuclei systems. And you can see uh, in this uh, picture, the circles identify active galactic nuclei that were detected by the, the BAT uh, telescope. Um, so the team finds that about a quarter of the galaxies identified in hard x-rays are in mergers or in close pairs with other galaxies. So this basically confirms that black holes, confirms the theory that black holes light up when the galaxies collide. And the data may offer insight into the future behavior of the black hole that we know is in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. And that's possibly why it's, some, it's somewhat quiescent, because we're not, in, we're not merging within our galaxy. So when an Andromeda galaxy crashes into our, our galaxy sometime in the next billion years, you, you might not want to be near the galactic center. <laughs> Just saying. Okay, next one, Chris. Now, this is a, a, an interesting... Uh, I found this an interesting news item because it's significant in terms of what it tells us about the universe. Um, it's a, maybe a little bit more difficult, so I'll go into some detail to try to explain it. Uh, using observations with NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and ESA's XMM Newton X-ray Observatory, both orbiting X-ray observatories, astronomers have announced a robust detection of a vast reservoir of intergalactic gas about 400 million light years from Earth. This discovery is the strongest evidence yet that the missing matter in the nearby universe is located in an enormous web of hot, diffuse gas. The missing matter is a shortfall in the density of normal matter that we can see. It's not uh, the mysterious uh, dark matter that clumps in galaxies and causes them to spin too fast. Um, now, why do we think this, is, this matter is missing or, or was missing until recently? Uh, why should we think that we know how much matter there is? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, astronomers think they understand pretty good what happened uh, in the moments after the Big Bang, and we know how much, uh, based on the temperatures that should have been there, how much hydrogen was turned into helium, how much helium was turned into lithium, and how these, these things happened. So we know how much and looking at the cosmic uh, microwave background, the, the echo from that explosion, we can really have a good idea of how much matter, normal matter, there should be in the universe. And amazingly, this estimate agrees with measurements of uh, highly redshifted absorption lines in the spectrum of the most distant quasars. Now, there's a lot of content in that sentence, a lot of big words. So, let me try to, to explain it. So we know that these distant quasars are distant active galactic nuclei, big black holes that are shooting out jets of material. Think of them as bright lighthouses, and they create a nice continuum of, of emission. Well, if you have a, a cloud of cold gas that the lighthouse shines on, it's going to absorb some light. And gas absorbs light at particular wavelengths. And we know what those wavelengths are because we can see it here in the lab on Earth. And this is actually a a noisy spectrum of uh, an emission from a, an active galactic nuclei or a quasar somewhere in the background, and these blips are absorption features in that, uh, in that emission. And redshift, of course, Richard explained it as well, those dark lines in the spectrum of stars tell you how far, how fast something is moving towards you or how, how fast it's moving away from you. And things that are really, really far away in the edge of the universe are all really redshifted. And this is called the Hubble flow. We know that things that are further away are moving faster away, uh, and things that are closer are moving not quite so fast away from us. And this is the part of the expansion of the universe. So based on the wavelength of these lines, we can estimate how far away these clouds are that are absorbing the light from the quasar. And based on the depth of the lines, we can estimate how much material is in these clouds. 
So by doing this for the most distant quasars in the universe, we have a good idea of how much matter there actually was recently after the Big Bang in these cold uh, clouds of hydrogen, these intergalactic clouds. So it's neat that that actually uh, agrees with what we get from the, the models of the Big Bang. So we thought we knew how much matter there was in the universe, but when we look around ourselves in the nearby galaxy and we count all the stars in the galaxy and we measure all the uh, gas that's in the clouds in our galaxy, uh, there's a problem. We only find half as much matter, normal matter, as there was when the galaxy started. And if we assume that the universe is, is Copernican and, and we're not in some sort of special void where the matter just disappeared, then it's a little bit embarrassing. It really doesn't work very well. So the mystery then is where does this missing matter reside in the current universe? Well, the most simple explanation is that these cold gas clouds that we see in absorbing quasar light in the, in the far edge of the universe have heated up. And when they heat up, the hydrogen becomes ionized. The electrons pop off the protons, and all you get is bare protons and bare electrons. And they don't cause absorption lines. It's very difficult to see ionized hydrogen because it doesn't create fingerprints in spectra. Like, and that's how we want to, to look at it. Uh, that's the only, really the only way we have to look at it. So it's actually quite dark if it were completely ionized. So this latest work supports the predictions that most of this missing matter is in this web of, of hot, diffuse gas that's been heated up since the Big Bang, and they call it the warm, hot intergalactic medium, or WIM. Uh, so scientists think the WIM is material left over after the formation of galaxies, which was later enriched by elements blown out of galaxies and shock heated over billions of years from, from stars. Uh, confirmed detections of the WIM have been difficult because you can't see it, and it's extremely low density. Um, observations and simulations suggest that the WIM has a density equivalent to six protons per cubic meter. That's not very dense. So it's kind of, you know, even though it's extremely hot, million degrees, if you were to, you know, be in the whim, you would freeze to death before, you know, one of them actually, more of them actually hit you uh, because it's just so, so diffuse. For comparison, the interstellar medium in our galaxy, the, di the diffuse gas between the stars has about a million hydrogen atoms per cubic meter, so a million times more dense just in, in the inter interstellar space. And the best vacuum system that you can make on Earth here but with, with you know, state-of-the-art vacuum pumps is, is a million times more dense than that. So it's, it's a million, million times less dense than the best vacuum system we can produce on Earth. However, space is big. In the immortal words of, of Douglas Adams, it's really big. <laughs> you just don't believe, you won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. I mean, you may think it's a long way down the road to the chemists, but that's just peanuts to space. <laughs> so, some whiffs of the whim have led astronomers to keep looking for it, and this is no exception. We've looked at it in the ultraviolet, and you've seen dim emission or absorptions in the ultra emission in the ultraviolet, emission in hard X-rays, uh, but that's only from the stuff that's extremely hot to get hard X-rays from this stuff and it's so not very dense, so it only samples a little fraction, but most of it's around a million degrees, and that's where these absorption lines of oxygen uh, were seen. Uh, so at 400 million light years, we know exactly where the redshift should be. This is absorption from highly ionized oxygen in our galaxy from this quasar that comes through this wall of galaxies called the sculptor wall, and this is where we would expect the line to be from the gap from the redshift at 400 million light years away. Uh, so what we've seen is that there is highly ionized oxygen in the spaces between the galaxies in Sculptor. So we know from the depth of this roughly how much there is, uh, what the density is. We don't really know how much total mass is in there. We have to estimate the ratio between oxygen and hydrogen, uh, but it's a big, there's a big multiplier there between oxygen and hydrogen, of course. And we know it to, you know, within a, a factor of two or three, and that's good enough for astronomers. Uh, so the women in the wall absorbs the X-rays from the AGN as they make their journey across intergalactic space to Earth. This little blip 
basically then tells us about half of the normal matter in the universe. So, you know, it doesn't seem like much on the graph, but the, uh, the importance of it shouldn't be overlooked. So in addition to having corroborated the data using both Chandra and XMM-Newton, the new study also removes another uncertainty from previous claims by being associated with a known grouping of galaxies. So it's not just a random blip that might be uh, disproven or, or you know, might be an error in the interpretation of where the line comes from. It's, it's where they predicted it should be. It's the depth they predicted it should be. Uh, we, don't, we still don't understand quite a bit about this. We don't understand the chemical makeup of, of this stuff, where it exactly came from. Was it cold gas that it's been heated up, or is it stuff that's blown out of galaxies from supernova? So there's a lot yet to learn. But uh, it is uh, quite a significant discovery, so uh, keep t stay tuned and maybe uh, we'll find out more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Uh, next up and last before the break is uh, Tim Cole to talk to you about Sky Tools 3. The left hand silly button. Left hand silly button. Yes. When I'm calling you. Okay, it's black. Okay, folks, um, you guys may remember last month uh, Gary Susick mentioned uh, Sky Tools. Um, that happens to be a, a package that I've been fiddling with for a long time. Um, I have no involvement with the, uh, with the, the, uh, the publisher. I did do some of the beta testing on Sky Tools 2 when it first came out, so I just want to make sure that you know my background on this is, is clear. I have no vested interest in this, but I do happen to like the uh, I like the code. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this this month is uh, Sky Tools itself is kind of an odd little package that it's it's not easily defined as to what exactly it'll do for you. Um, so I thought it would be worth taking a, a few minutes just to go over what it does and that you can make a more informed decision as to whether or not you want to get it on the, uh, on the group behind that Gary's organizing and uh, I believe Chris is looking after some of the other details of it as well. Um, there's two flavors available, um, standard and, and pro. Um, I've been using the pro versions for a while. Um, basically, uh, the pro, you've got a deeper, uh, a deeper catalog, so go down to 22nd magnitude. And uh, there's a few more tools there for imaging and such like. It's up to you, of course, which one you really like. Um, okay. Uh, oh, these stupid buttons get me every time. The other forward, you twit. Now, um, that's basically the key of, of Sky Tools. This is this is basically a heart and soul. And for those of us who are used to all the graphic user user stuff, this looks pretty bland and probably very unappealing. And, Oh, picky poo, I have to read something. How dreadful. Oh. Um, <laughs> it's actually, though, it, it's kind of a cool thing. And the, the real key on this thing is this little bar up here on the top. Now, you can actually get some, uh, yeah, you can actually it, you can get a lot of details out of it. The basis of it is what's called an observing list, which is basically a list of related stuff. There's a bunch of them that come with it. You can download them from uh, users groups, or you make up your own. Uh, this is the uh, visual observing uh, page from the pro version, and this happens to be one that I like using for uh, sky parties and things like that, uh, show pieces for newbies. Um, that's one of the built-in ones. So here we've got a few of them. There's a, there's a lot of stuff buried in this page. Off here on the very left-hand side are little icons indicating what it is you're looking at. The little thing that looks like a yellowy square is the log icon, so that's indicating that I've got log entries for this. Um, the little gadget there that looks like a telescope observatory dome is a little marker for whether or not you observed it, which is something that came up uh, that I don't use much and I'm going to start using more. A rating and then a zillion and one uh, possible uh, columns you can use, more than you can ever show. So the, the real heart for this is the bar up on the top. And what this is, this is a representation of the night sky. It goes from, uh, it goes like a Julian Bay. It goes from noon till noon. And uh, the, uh, the green line here is 30 degrees altitude, air mass 2. That's the point where you're looking through twice as much air as you would be seeing straight up. And basically below that, you're down in the muck, and you're observing is far less than ideal. And above that, it's you know, less and less interference with air, and you've got a better chance of having a nice view. The uh, yellow line here is uh, the sun's altitude over the, uh, the timing point. 
the bluish line is the moon and the reddish line is the object we're interested in. So I've picked here the, uh, the Keystone Cluster M13. Now let's just uh, get a little closer view of this sucker. And um, what I've done here is I've dragged those little bars, the little red bars, to go from about 9 o'clock to about 4 in the morning. So basically from sunset to uh, I am flipping tired and I'm going to bed. Um, or if you want to be a real deep sky geek, um, that's when the moon's up and you're going to pretend that uh, you are no longer interested in looking at the sky. Um, and if you're a lunar nut like me or Brian McCullough, this is when you say, oh good, now it's high enough, I can really observe it well. Anyway, never mind. Uh, for that, you do not need sky tools. Now, one of the cool things here is you might notice begin, optimum, and end. And this is basically the program's assessment of when's a good time to look at what you're looking at. And uh, we take a close up here. It's showing us that uh, it's fairly high. That's what that little icon's telling you. And from um, 11.23 to uh, just before midnight is a pretty decent time to look at it. After midnight, when the moon's up, it starts getting all crummy, and it's not the best opportunity. So there's a lot of detail buried in this, and it's, it's kind of handy. You can sort on any of these, so I like sorting on the optimum because then I can decide when do I actually want to look at this. So in other words, um, I'm not going to, if I'm out at, at 12, uh, oh, I don't know, say, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 or something, and I'm kind of interested in looking at the, at the Hercules cluster, I'm going to get there fast. I'm not going to bother trying to find a wild duck or something because I'm going to have to wait. So it's kind of nice for being able to do some planning, and it's really nice if you're doing star parties or classes. Now the column over here, difficulty, is the program's best guess of how much difficulty it is to see it under perfect conditions based on your telescope. You'll see that I've specified my trusty 8-inch Schmidt cast up there and my Ottawa backyard, which is light polluted as all get out, and you can specify your degree of light pollution. Uh, the best difficulty is basically how good it is if everything were perfect in your backyard and the little uh, light thingy, the little stoplight thing is basically just the graphical, yeah, that's pretty good, or man, this really reeks. And the best indication, the, the, the program's best guess of what eyepiece you want to use from your list of eyepieces. There's a lot of database stuff in here. The other forward, you twit. Yes, that forward. Now, this actually is uh, one of the... Uh, promotional ones from uh, the, the, uh, the, the publisher's website. It's a one-man show at Flagstaff, Arizona, by a guy named Greg Crinklaw, who does a, a pretty decent job of maintaining this thing, and uh, he's a pretty cool guy to, to email with. Um, so basically, I'll go into this in a little more detail, but even though it's, it's a texty planning thing, there is still some reasonably good graphics in here, like the simulation of, of two satellites and a, and a shadow transit on, on the Jupiter. Which way am I going, you twit? Ah, yes. Up here, I've got the pop-up menu. Once I'm on this, I can right-click and get a whole list of things I can get. Uh, object information, a whole bunch of charts, and then a bunch of other things like go out and fetch the digital sky survey image. The other forward. Now, here's your basic object information. This is all pretty routine stuff, nothing really fantastic. You get this kind of cool little uh, visual synopsis, which yeah, it might be kind of fun. Uh, it is kind of nice to give you a, a sense of when it's nice to look at. Oh man, I keep doing this. Um, this is the one I really prefer because I can see my night bar in there, so it's telling me, uh, and I've got the little pop up there telling me that it's completely dark from X to X. That's the one I like when I'm looking at it because it gives me a, chance, a sense of seeing, you know, what am I up to this evening if I'm trying to look at this thing. And. Uh, then this one, this is a kind of a cool one as well. This is the year bar, and that's indicating when's a good time in the year to look at the object you're interested in. So this is telling me really that I can see it almost any time of year except for around uh, you know, New Year's, um, and it's really best in the height of summer. And you know, so I can do a little planning. Is it worth looking at now, or should I hang on and do it a little later? This is where you can get some graphic uh, stuff, a nice little sky chart. It's fairly straightforward, basic stuff. Um, I have this tuned, in my case, for the stars I can expect to see from my backyard. And if you really want to go and, I don't know, this is what you can see out in, I don't know, uh, Mississippi Mills for the sake of argument. Um, you know, so you can dial in the, the magnitude limits. I mean, fairly basic planetarium stuff. Uh, so it's basically just to keep it in one point shopping. Where it does get fun is you can pull up a uh, representation of what you would expect to see from your eyepiece. So here it's a representation from my 4-inch telescope, a 9.5 millimeter eyepiece, 
Um, this is showing the, the circle graphic for a globular cluster, and there's a little indication here, a little arrow showing you where it would drift if your uh, clock drive isn't running. So basically just a sense of, you know, what am I, what am I, am I expecting to see in my eyepiece? How much of it's gonna fill and, you know, that sort, of, that sort of thing. This is one of the really fun parts for the program. Now this, to my mind, you saw the other version of this earlier, this is really the cool chart, and I like printing these out sometimes, and uh, you know, it, it does print out white on, uh, black on white, so you're not using 827 gallons of very expensive printer ink, which turns out to be more expensive than Dom Perignon champagne ounce for ounce, by the way. If somebody did that comparison. Um, now I happen to think printer ink is far more valuable than champagne, but anyway, that's me. Uh, up here you have the naked eye survey, okay, M13, big whoop, uh, most of us know where it is, but just in case. There's the image from my finder, yes, I am wimpy, I have a right and erect image finder, I know for many of us around here that is sacrilege, but I'm a lazy sod, so I like it, right image. And over here is the simulated view through my eyepiece. So again, this is just giving me a nice little bit of, of what can I see and what can I expect to see. Now what I've gone from here is uh, multiple entries, that's what the check marks are, and uh, this is something that I'm hoping to use for classwork. Uh, this is um, one of the newer features that have come out is the ability to do thumbnail charts. So basically you can come up with a little chart showing, okay, this is the stuff we're going to talk about tonight, and here's your handout for it. So it's kind of fun. Um, now you'll notice here that the representations for galaxies and stuff, it's all very graphical. You're not looking at super duper graphics, that's not what it's built for. Now, over here, we've got, this looks like the last one you saw, but this is actually the imaging uh, page. And what this is doing is this is trying to help you out for imaging. So we'll see here that we've got some kind of confusing looking columns, which aren't as bad as it looks. And if you look carefully, there's a little addition to the star, um, to the night bar, and this little blue line, which is an indication of the quality that you can expect from your imaging. So it's getting a little better after sunset and gets really bad after midnight when the moon starts to rise and then by the time the moon hits air mass 30, your imaging has just gone completely to pot. Uh, you'll notice here that instead of my eyepiece, I'm specifying the camera that I'm using and uh, the filter that I want to use in the beginning and that sort of stuff. What I've brought up here is the exposure calculator. Um, there's a lot of stuff here and it can be a little bit uh, intimidating. But what this is doing is this is showing you windows when you can, when you can get your photographs and uh, the, the characteristics um, and a rating of how good or bad they are. So in this case, the one that's highlighted there is just before midnight. So this is my best crack at getting a good, a good image of M13. Um, shows I can get my, my best exposure here of uh, three minutes without the, uh, the, the sky uh, the skylight uh, starting to wreck my image and ruin my signal to noise ratio. Something that confuses the heck out of people is the ex exposure duration here. <laughs> that's, that's not the duration of the exposure. That's the duration of the window that you have to work with. So um, again, this is really cool stuff for entering. You, can, you have to enter your seeing reasonably accurately uh, or else it can't do a decent job of estimating signal to noise ratio and resolution. So it does require a bit. How accurate this is in terms of imaging, I am a rotten astrophotographer, so I really can't tell you offhand that this is really super wonderful. I suspect it's not bad. It certainly gives me better stuff, well, I shouldn't say better. For me with astrophotography, less horrible results than I get when I'm just trying to do it by, uh, yeah, I, I guess a couple of, well, I always do one minute exposure, so I guess I'll do those. Anyway, it, it helps me. Uh, suck a little less badly with astrophotography, so uh, I'll have to leave that to other people who actually can do something they're willing to admit to. Um, one of the things that's kind of cool for star parties is let it generate a list, an observing list. So uh, it's kind of handy because it, it can sort of jog your, your thoughts. Oh yeah, right, I haven't observed that for ages. That could be fun. So this will produce a little list for you. And finally, the observation logging, I shouldn't say quite finally, the observation logging is really kind of nice. There's lots of entry points here. Um, so here's my little entry for it. Um, and I found I've gotten quite, quite enamored with this and all my logging now is done on Skytools rather than writing it down on paper. 
um, largely because it's all in one place. I get to back it up, and my handwriting is almost as bad as my astrophotography. My wife says it's actually worse, but I think she's just buttering up my astrophotography. Uh, <laughs> Now, one of the things that I like about this is you want to be able to back all that data up, and it does that. But um, you're also permitted by the license to load this sucker on any number of computers you have, which is really kind of nice, because I hate all that copy protection garbage. Um, I understand where it comes from, but I hate it. So what this is letting me do is synchronize my computers. So the computer I take out with me, my little netbook, uh, and then the laptop, the uh, desktop that I use to keep all my records on, um, I can bring it back in, sync them up. You can sync them directly, or you can make a little database. And in my case, I use a database that I put onto a network drive, and then I can link up my three or four different computers and tie them together. So uh, I'll tell, there's, this is just a very brief run through. There's a ton of stuff in here. Now, the basis of it is specifying your telescopes. So you get to specify, um, well, here's a list of telescopes that I've observed with, a partial list, um, all the basic stuff. I like his pull down for optics. It goes from clean to filthy, which I, I rather like. There's a pull down for filthy, which just amuses me no end. That's actually what I have specified for the 15, the uh, CSTM 15 inches. I, I list that as extremely filthy, which it is. Um, <laughs> You know, the other one, I didn't bother showing you the entry bit for the, for the eyepieces because that's pretty basic stuff, but here's the entry page for camera data. And uh, there's a bunch of pre-filled in ones but, uh, and, and a bunch of standard detectors, but you can enter a lot of this data and pull as much as you can off the data sheets. You'll actually have trouble finding all this data for many cameras, but the more you can get, the better, and, and people are trading this on the, uh, the Yahoo group. So this is your basis for your um, exposure calculator. So there's a lot of databasing stuff here, so you really do want to back it up and move it along. Um, Gary was making arrangements. Uh, they're going to try and get the, uh, the quantity discount on this. So uh, Chris carefully put in the, uh, oh man, I feel like I should be wearing a little mask and telling you to wipe off spills or something. Anyway, um, or chop up onions or something. Anyway. Um, so that, that's basically the price tag on it. It's, uh, I like the package. It's a cool package. And uh, but I, I just want to make sure that you're making an informed decision when you're going out to use it. Because it's, kind of, it's something that kind of defies the explanation of what it does. I like it. If I could only pick one, that would probably be the one I'd pick. Um, but at any rate, you can decide whether or not it's something that's going to make your evening a little nicer. Um, so it, yeah, I find it better the crummier the sky you've got. Anyway, there you go, folks. There's the quickie rundown of it. Um, not much else I can say about it. Uh, so, what? Has a mic? Mic, yes. Just add a few notes to the end of this. As you can see on the chart, um, we're able to get a discount of 40% by ordering it through the club and having somewhere between 10 and 24 members interested. We already have more than 10 people, so we're assured of a 40% discount. It's possible that we'd be over 24, but uh, only that many new, new people came tonight and, and uh, wanted it. The price is $107, uh, the, the discounted price for the Pro Edition. However, with this group purchase, you can purchase either the standard or the Pro, they don't care. The same discount applies. I can't tell you the real cost in Canadian dollars with shipping and so on, but you can probably guesstimate that fairly well. We, we talked about this a month ago. There's been an email to the entire club. So I think it's only fair to those who've been asking for a month now that we order it quickly. So I, I plan to uh, assemble the order one week from now and get back to anyone who's shown interest and give you my best guess of what the price is and ask you for a payment in advance. And then I'll put the order in uh, quickly for everyone. Hopefully we can have it for the next meeting. Thanks. So if you're interested, interested take a chat with uh, Gary. If you want to stand up or put your hand up, Gary, for I can't imagine anyone does not know Gary there, or uh, come and see me, or send me an email. Thanks. Uh, okay. I honestly don't know if it works on a Mac. I really don't know. I never bothered checking. It might, but I don't honestly can't tell you. Who owns a Mac? Yeah. What's a Mac? <laughs> hey! Oh, wait, that's something those yeah. art geeks use. Yeah. Uh, for an answer to that, I'd uh, suggest taking a look at the uh, website. Yeah. I'm not sure myself. That's probably the best. Yeah. A lot of people are uh, producing uh, programs in uh, dual format, 
right now so that uh, a lot of stuff you buy, you get both versions on the same disc. So I'd certainly check it out. You may find it, uh, it is available. I, I honestly can't tell you. I, I do have checked it. It does not run on the Mac, but it will run on, uh, on PC simulators that run on the Mac. So. Ah, mm -hmm. there you go. There is a nerd. There you go. <laughs> thank, thank you, Attila. Thank God for one. Yeah, thank God. Uh, Bart Dector. Next one up, uh, Bart is going to talk to us about his mobile observatory. And I have my go. assistant. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Hi. Um, Hello. Ooh. Okay. That's okay. working. We have a question for you. Yes. Nice house with wheels. How do you move that big house? Oh, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, the reason for the question mark is that uh, this really, I mean, it's not really an observatory, is it? But, you know, I live in, uh, as you can see from the picture here, you know, we live in suburbia with lots of uh, lights. My neighbors all feel the need to leave both of their garage lights on and, uh, you know, the street lights along the street and all the rest of it. And I can't always get out where I'd like to you know, to be able to look at things and that. But uh, I do get quite a, an opportunity to this way with uh, using my driveway. And I, I can't use the back of the house because it's a, a walkout design. So I have a three-story high house on one side. And I, out of the entire neighborhood, they spared five trees from the bulldozer. And I got two of them in my backyard. When I moved in, I thought that was great. <laughs> I'm not so sure anymore. I kind of like to get rid of them now. Anyway, um, so I actually had bought this little trailer that you see in the picture here a while back. It's just a little utility trailer. And as the fall was approaching last year, and I'm getting a little older, and I'm finding that, you know, the cold weather is uh, not as pleasant as I found it at one time. And I just sort of thought, you know, that's kind of it now for the winter. So, and then I looked at this trailer, and I thought, you know, I could use that. And uh, so I've set it all up. It, it's parked there a lot of the time, and, but I can also take it away and go places with it. Um, I have it connected into the, through the garage. It's plugged in, so I've got power. I've actually got my telephone out there, and I've got uh, um, internet and so on. So it's, it's a really comfortable little place, and uh, I'm able to do a lot more observing much quicker than having to everything in from outside so I thought you might like to have a look at it so I think all of these ones will just go ahead um, again you can see that with the size of the trailer I think the angle there looks a little odd but it's um, uh, about uh, five feet across by about nine feet long and during the summer I can store my telescope and everything in the trailer and I've put it in in such a way that the heaviest stuff is, and the order in which I set things up, is at the back of the trailer so that I can kind of unload the trailer and get myself set up all in, uh, you know, in one shot sort of thing. It, it's taken my setup time down to about 20 minutes to either set up or to uh, uh, put everything away at the end of an evening. So that is less than half the time that it used to take me. So again, you can see my street here. We do have street lights, and I don't know why, but apparently you're always supposed to have those if you have buses. We don't have buses, but we have street lights. There's inside of the, uh, once all this stuff is moved out and set up, that's the setup in the, uh, in the trailer. And uh, I use the three monitors. One is, the one on the left is actually a video monitor as well. So I can, from Mountain Cam, I can put an image on there or I can repeat the other year. You can see the amount of light that we have uh, at night and even almost read out, uh, outside there. But, you know, straight up, it's pretty good, actually. Uh, for when we do take it away to somewhere uh, dark, I've got the little generator so I can uh, keep all the equipment running. There's a little umbilical cord there that hooks up and you can see going to the telescope uh, to the uh, Celestron there, the, my little umbilical cord with all of my uh, cables and stuff for the cameras and the lights. This was that little thing we did at the school for my uh, uh, my grandson's class. So I was able to use a projector as well. And I didn't get pictures later on in the evening when we had about 50 people because I was too busy sort of keeping everything going. But And Haley's going to tell you what she does in all of this. 
I take um, the Messier catalog because I find all the stars and planets and nebulas and galaxies. And I'm going to show you some of them. <laughs> well, you don't need to do that, but what, you, what do you do when you find the ones that you like? I show them to you. <laughs> hey, you're a little shy, are you? <laughs> yes, well, Haley comes out with her thermos of, uh, of herbal tea, and she comes out with me, and she sits in the trailer with the Messier catalog, and she'll go through that, and, and she'll say, well, Papa, can we look at M101 or <laughs> whatever? She finds things that she likes to look of, and if then we'll look on Starry Night and see if we can you know, actually see it from where we are, and if so, then we'll slew the telescope over and she gets to have a look at it through the telescope. So she's my little mini astronomer here, and she's been a, a real joy to have, uh, have along in learning to, you know, play with all this stuff and that, so. Anyway, that's all. Thank you, Bart, and thank you, Stephanie. Very nice. Okay, uh, next up we have Murray Campbell to talk to, uh, to you about the, one of his recent observing sessions. See if I can get myself. If you can get there. <laughs> okay, folks, what this is, I have a 20-page prepared speech. I was told 10 minutes, by, but just like uh, Mr. Boo, little goalie puck guys, I'll take as long as I want. Okay, this story is called Making a Wrong Turn at... Casapilla, but making a wrong turn right at Casapilla. So this is my story of what happened on my on 10 May, or rather, what may happen when, despite one's best planning and preparation efforts to organize a good, excellent observation se session, something shiny leads you astray, something wonderful. So we'll try that button. Okay. So setting the scene. I've been monitoring the sky, the seasonal changes, lunar phases, sunrise, sunsets, and shiny objects and such. Uh, last year, half 50% moon, and not there, but Jupiter, and over there, geese, but you can't see them because it's reduced. And looking over my left fence, sunset. Uh, gonna love this. Anyways, sunny skies, wonderful stuff, but I had a little challenge for the May 10th. In fact, a lot of them. And that is, my mission was to find, seek out, and identify comets using visually recording, not cameras, because I don't do that yet, for positions of comets Wild, McNaught, there's three of them, R1, C, K, Temple 2, and maybe 141P Schmoltz, maybe, because it was right at the horizon, and using all this equipment. So, what was I doing? The challenge is visually observe and record these fleeting objects require some preparation. Joe Silverman gave a pointed presentation of the mythology and expectations at a RASC meeting not, not a year or two ago. So what can we do? Well, McNaught, R1, low on the horizon at sunset, and of course, there's 141P that is even lower. I discounted that because you can't see it. K5, near Gamma Cephas. Hey, we can get there. 81P Wild. Yo, I actually got that one. Uh, Temple 2. That's pretty well near where uh, Jupiter was uh, last year. So. so now, I was ready to go hunting. Memorizing these positions. Again, lots of planning going on. So picture this, I have established myself on a lightly dewy grass, southern edge of my backyard septic field. My, hey, oh, we gotta love it. Over my neighbors, barnyard, cows, freshening. And that thing over there is a light that kills everything. So that's the challenge. So the story goes, as I started to scan the northwestern horizon, not far from Venus, when I got distracted by something shiny. So star hopping. First, over the heifer paddock, as you saw, to my neighbor's barn light, through Andromeda, without success. Gee, I wonder why. Then over to Cassiopeia, to star hop onto Cepheus. 
But before I completed this hop, I was distracted by something shiny, really shiny. There was a series of star chains that I found interesting. Following this line brought me to another star field, which was well below McNaught. Definitely the wrong turn. So I started, started to sketch this thing. This being oriented a little bit different. This is my top and bottom and north that way. So I started to sketch this. I got more interested, more interested again. So I couldn't find an anchor star to mount these nebulas, shiny objects, and this chain. So I went on and on and on and on until <laughs> I ran out of pad. So there we are. I was so distracted by shiny objects, I even got this red satellite that went north through my field of view. So as you can see, that's the original ring that I had. And then, oh, got to extend it for this guy. Oh, got to extend it for this one. Oh, look like, and, and like I said, I ran out of pad. So that's my pad. So large nebula area, open clusters, nice shiny uh, ga uh, galaxy right there. And you know what? This is the best part. I have no idea what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to be up here. I ended up down here. So making the wrong turn, but making it right. This chart shows the approximate region of where R1, where I should have been, and where I wasn't. So this image here gives the approximate pl placation of where I was in the uh, corrective view of Cassiopeia, off, right turn, whoop, got lost. So this is what we might find in there. Whoop, nice shiny, but I actually forgot how wonderful this place is, how beautiful the, the, the sky can be. Uh, granted, at this time of year, it's all washed out, going to the northern light as the sun comes down, as you saw in the earlier picture, the setting sun. This is all in sun, but this is really, really gorgeous. So we have lots of other features, and I don't know why, but as I was drawing, it said, this thing looks familiar. I don't know why it is. You know, I said, like, well, that's not what I was looking at. I said, like, why is it? And so I took notice of it, tried to figure out where I'm at. Whoa, gee, gee, that might be familiar for some folks. And there again, Cephas. So what I like to do is to look at these shiny things, record them, and then I went back into my little star chart and tried to figure out where I was, what I am doing. And what I came out was, is although I was looking for Comet McNaught and a couple others, I didn't find them. But that didn't matter. I spent two and a half hours just in that one little area, sketching and observing and redoing it again. And that was wonderful. Yeah, I <coughs> spent a day and a half planning for this thing. And who cares? I had a lot of fun. So, at last, I can say I did not find the comet McNaught, but my takeaway message is to all of you is this. Take the time. Take the time to enjoy those wrong turns. Sometimes something wonderful will come out of it, despite what happens. And even though you did the planning, you still have something wonderful to look at. Anyways, I'm Murray Campbell, and I get distracted by shiny objects. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you, Murray. Uh, very, uh, very entertaining talk. Uh, next up, observation reports. Uh, this time around, we have uh, the five people listed. If uh, Tom Bur Butterworth is available, maybe you could pop up and the rest of you in order as we go. Uh, this year, I upgraded my telescope to the same one that Bart Tector just showed you, uh, Celestron 11 inch. HD optics with the CGE Pro mount. Last year I did my uh, photography uh, with a, uh, a guide scope mounted on top of a five inch refractor. This year I'm uh, off axis guiding with a radio guider. Finding guide stars is a, a lot more difficult. This is my uh, first attempt, M51. It's an hour exposure with 30 minutes of dark subtracted from it. There's a lot of uh, haze around the galaxy. Some of that is image processing, but that, those are real structures. So my next goal is to do deeper images, several hours of exposure if I can, possibly. My, my muse is Rob Gendler. Check out his website for quality images and astronomy. Okay. 
I have to thank Deborah Saravalo. This uh, is the image that is published in this month's image of Astronauts. This is 90 minutes of exposure with 60 minutes of dark subtracted. And again, the object is a lot more extensive than what this image shows, but you're starting to see some of the faint outlying regions of the, uh, the planetary. And this is, uh, everybody knows the Ring Nebula. I'm very happy with the image. Uh, there are four stars that do show within the nebula itself. My goal is to gain, or to try to get tighter focus on my stars. It's uh, very difficult at that focal length, 2,800 millimeters. So I'm quite happy. Again, this is an hour exposure with 30 minutes of dark subtracted. Yes, there is. Uh, just here, there is a very, very faint galaxy. It's 221 million light years away. That is just starting to record. And again, if you check out Rob Jenner's image of this object, you'll see it quite, quite well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom. Next up, uh, Derek McLeod. All right, so uh, I have a couple images here. Uh, this is what is known as a uh, uh, a uh, circum. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I'll put the title back up. Yeah. There thank you. Circumhorizontal. A circumhorizontal arc, and uh, a couple pictures here. Um, it's a it's a type of uh, halo uh, that is fairly uh, rare. I've never seen one before. There's a couple of interesting things I want to point out first. Is that the Hopefully you can see there is some color differentiation uh, there that's fairly fairly good on the original. And the arc is also parallel to the horizon. That's the sun above there. So basically, uh, how do these form and how can you possibly see them? Well, there's really two, uh, two criteria that you need. First, you need light, the sun, and you need clouds. And let me talk a bit about the clouds here. There's cirrus clouds, which are uh, often composed of uh, ice crystals. And these need to be a particular type of ice crystal that's flat, and it acts as a prism. And it takes the sunlight and it, uh, splits it up into the various colors, uh, the red, yellow, and green that you can see there. The other thing in here, of course, is uh, as a light source, is the sun. And uh, there are some particular requirements that are kind of interesting for it. The sun has to be at least 58 degrees above the horizon for the elevation. So this is the sort of thing that uh, you can actually obviously see in Ottawa, because I took this picture in Canada. But it's more likely you're going to see this down in southern latitudes, where the better part of the day, the sun has a high elevation like that. But for Ottawa, we. Uh, uh, can have a sun elevation from about late April till mid-August. So um, the, uh, the sun in this particular day, you probably can't see at the bottom, but this was taken on the 18th of May. And the sun on this particular day was a 64 degrees elevation. So uh, under uh, circumstances where, let's say you imagine the sun was straight overhead, so you were at a southerly latitude. And you had cirrus clouds around you, surrounding you. You could, in fact, actually have this arc surrounding you at 360 degrees. But the cirrus clouds are typically wispy. They're fragmented. I'll just go on to the next picture, which is a, um, which is a close-up of this one, of the previous one. And this one here is about 20 degrees across. Uh, but you can see a bit more of the red and the yellow, and there is a bit of a green color underneath. And theoretically, I, I, I have red, but I don't know if anybody's ever seen one. If you had a, uh, a bright lunar night and the clouds were just correct with the ice crystals, you may be able to see this at night too. Thanks. Thank you, Mayor. Next up, uh, Paul Cloniger. Uh, 
Uh, hi again, everybody. I've got a few uh, shots for you tonight. Uh, my first object is Copernicus Crater in uh, the Ocean of Storms. Uh, it's one of my favorite craters to, to check out because uh, the, the lighting angles uh, that you get at different times of the month uh, present different types of features that you can see. Uh, this is a, a very uh, a fortuitous uh, shadow arrangement, as you'll see uh, coming up. The crater itself is uh, 3.9 kilometers deep from the top of the rim down to the floor. Uh, about 93 kilometers in diameter, so as the crow flies, roughly between here and Brockville. So it's a, it's a good sized hole. And uh, it's estimated that the, uh, the uh, asteroid that crashed into the moon uh, and created the crater did so about 800 million years ago. So as things on the moon goes, it's fairly recent. Next one, please. So when you zoom in on this, uh, on this crater area, yeah, there's, there's, I love this area because there's just so much uh, interesting geology that you can see here. Um, you can see the, one of the things that always strikes me is the ejecta blanket from this. Uh, the ejecta blanket is basically uh, an impact splat of material that gets thrown out when, when, uh, when the asteroid impacts the lunar surface and it just gets spread out all over the surface, including the formation of rays uh, from, from certain craters. In fact, some of the rays from Copernicus stand, extend to, to uh, over 800 kilometers distant from the, from the impact site. And you can see here that uh, the, 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 the ejecta material uh, is overlying even some of this mountainous region here. You can see how it's spreading across there. And uh, some of the uh, ray formations overlie the smoother but older mare material. Next, please. So when you zoom in a little bit closer, get a little bit more close and personal with it, uh, you, you can study some of the uh, features within uh, Copernicus, Copernicus itself. You'll notice that uh, in the, uh, right in the center, there's a, uh, a complex of three central peaks. Often craters of this size do have a central peak type of formation from uh, isostatic rebound after the, uh, after the, <coughs> after the impact. Uh, in Copernicus's case, it's, uh, it's uh, three actual peaks, and they're about 1.2 kilometers uh, above the floor. Uh, it has about three distinct terraces. Uh, these extend about 30 kilometers in towards the center of the crater, so they're quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite prominent. And uh, you can see some slumping near the, uh, the crater floor where material has, has fallen in. And again, you can see uh, the ejecta blanket quite nicely. And strings of chain craters here and secondary craters caused by material falling back after the initial impact. One of the, uh, one of the uh, fortunate features I got on this night, I think it's one of Brian's favorites, is uh, a formation called the Cave of Copernicus, which uh, uh, for uh, you know, it lo looks looks somewhat like a large cave in the in the terraced walls. By the way, north is oriented this way in the in the in the photograph towards the right, not up. I just wanted to make use of the landscape. So, uh, cave of Copernicus is right there. Now, this is a feature that's kind of elusive. You can only see this for a few hours on one day, once a month, and that's what the shadows give you there. Um, it's not actually a cave. It's believed to be a, a slumped part of the terrace, or perhaps it's even a collapsed uh, crater itself. But uh, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting feature to watch for, again, uh, mostly because it's, uh, you only get a very narrow window to see it. And a, just an interesting little sidebar, Copernicus was one of the prime candidate sites uh, for a landing when they were running the, man, uh, the Apollo program. Uh, it, was, uh, it was considered to be the primary target for Apollo 20. Unfortunately, that never got a chance to fly, so we'll, we'll have to take our, our views from afar still. So from there, uh, we'll take something a little uh, further afield. And uh, we'll have a look at the uh, the uh, the Eagle Nebula. This is, these are the famous pillars from uh, from the uh, pillars of creation from the Hubble um, at the center here. What the pillars are are basically columns of gas and dust that are light years long. They're in the process of gravitationally collapsing and forming new stars in their interiors, and uh, as well as these dark globules around the the pillars. Uh, uh, there are the home to protostars, stars in the in the process of of, of forming. Um, the pillars themselves are, as I said, are a few light years long, and and uh, and the the region itself is about 20 kilometers, uh, uh, or 20 kilometers, 20 light years across, about 7,000 light years from from Earth. Now, an interesting sidebar. So, I obviously just took this picture recently. This is how the pillars looked in visible light about 7,000 years ago, because it's 7,000 light years distant. Three years ago, the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, took a picture of, of the same region. If I can get the next one up there. Spitzer Space Telescope uh, images in infrared, so essentially it's looking at heat, uh, longer wave radiation than, uh, than visible light. And what it discovered is that there is uh, a cloud of very hot gas and dust that is very close to the pillars. 
And what, what astronomers who study this have, uh, have determined, or, or believe anyway, is that this mass of hot gas is sort of um, approaching the pillars. It's a result of what they believe uh, is a nearby supernova explosion about 6,000 years ago. So even though we see the pillars as intact now, if you're out where the pillars are now, in fact, you may see that the pillars have crumbled, believe it or not. We think of these things as constant and long duration in space, but it's not always the, all, not always the case. In fact, the pillars may have been disrupted or disintegrated by the shock wave of that supernova, which astronomers believe would have reached the pillars by now. But of course, we won't see the sign of that for about another thousand years or so because that light is still en route to Earth. So. Uh, for an RASC meeting, maybe a few thousand years in the future, somebody will do a time lapse and they'll say, watch the pillars collapse, you know, so, so that's if we let it happen. I'm, I'm thinking of starting a fund, you know, save the pillars. I'll take collections <laughs> later. <laughs> save the whales, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, uh, interesting sidebar there. Another star forming region. Uh, sorry, what was that? <laughs> Another uh, interesting star-forming region, uh, the, uh, the Horsehead Nebula, as everybody knows. Uh, again, the Horsehead is a, is a cloud of dark gas uh, and, and dust, uh, dark nebula, about five light years long. So it's a good-sized object, about 1,500 uh, light years from Earth. And uh, the bright, very, very overexposed star is Alnitok, which is the leftmost star in the belt of, uh, of Orion. Uh, Alnitok is also the power source for the Flame Nebula, causing the Flame Nebula to to, to glow because of the uh, energetic uh, uh, light that, uh, that impacts in the gas uh, in that region. Next one. Last one I have for you is the Rosette Nebula. Again, a star forming region um, just to the, to, to the left of Orion for those of you that aren't familiar with it. It's in Monoceros and uh, this is a region, uh, this, this is a, a, a fairly large uh, uh, star forming region. Uh, this, uh, the structure itself is estimated to be about 130 light years across and uh, it contains probably about 10,000 times the mass of the sun in combined gas and dust. And the small cluster here which uh, you can see with, uh, with a reasonably small telescope, you can't see the rest of the structure, you need, you need to do it photographically because the, uh, it's, it is fairly dim, but uh, the, the cluster itself is quite obvious. That's, uh, NGC 2244, if I remember my numbers correctly. Anyway, that cluster did form from the materials of that nebula, and uh, that nebula continues to be an active source of uh, star formation with, uh, with that amount of gas and dust. Thank you very much. That's actually with a, a plain Jane six inch Newtonian. So if you think, if you, think you need a, you know, 20 or $30,000 worth of equipment, you really don't. We're in the golden age of astronomy. That's a, a $300 Newtonian. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, uh, Rolf Meyer with some lunar observations. Okay, so uh, this is another in a continuing series of uh, images of the uh, uh, entire moon. Um, and uh, the moon was about two and a half days old at uh, when this picture was taken. Difficulty is is very low when it's just past new, so this is actually a, a <coughs> composite of uh, uh, four images stacked on top of each other. Um, and if we could just uh, advance one, Chris, we can see. Okay, so so I'll enlarge this portion of the uh, of the image. Uh, that's Mer Mary Chrysium, and normally you you don't see that illuminated like this because normally it's. Uh, uh, kind of flat uh, because the uh, the terminator has moved off a bit and the um, uh, it, it just all you get all you, you're not getting any shadows so let's look in a little closer so there's the en enlargement and you can see it's actually surrounded by quite a bit of uh, uh, what well, looks like walls all around it and it looks like uh, almost a depressed area so uh, uh, that, and that's just at the edge of the moon um, uh, and uh, so that's that. And uh, sorry, I don't know diameters and ages and all that stuff. So uh, next slide. So this is what we have so far. Um, uh, the, one, the last one on the lower right is the one I took, I showed you last month. Um, but you can see, for example, you can see Mary Chrysium in all of those. 
Um, but you notice that the it looks different in every one of them, and uh, in some of them, like the like the upper right, it's it's very close to the edge of the moon, um, and then the one below it, it's moved off quite a bit. So this is going to be part of the challenge of making the uh, the uh, overall mosaic because the uh, libration is uh, different for each for each one. But I'll probably use a some kind of a computer program to to compensate for that. And um, was there one more? Did we, did we put the other one in? Oh, yes. Uh, so unfortunately, I was going to have people guess what this was, but Chris labeled it. So <laughs> because, you see, the problem is that uh, Leo is quite distorted now because you've got two, two bright planets in Leo that um, um, kind of distort the shape of it, if you're familiar with the shape of, of Leo. So um, can you all identify which, which one is Saturn and which one is Mars? OK, well, yeah, so I'm not, so not going to point them out. You can go out and have a look and try and figure it out. Thank you, Brian. Right. Sorry, Brian. Thank you all. Uh, next up, Paul Commission with a couple of deep sky observations. I think he's just going to shout at you. Yeah, I'm going to shout at you. I'm not going to use that microphone. Uh, I'm showing tonight two. Uh, well, these objects have already been shown, but I wanted to. What I wanted to do mainly was take a minute or two to describe to you the various classification of galaxies. Now, this is M51 NGC 5194. It's also an ARP object. Now they showed it before. Now you notice here that there's a large bulge and the arms are a little tight on this one compared to some of the other ones. And you notice there uh, NGC uh, 5195. Now that thing is 500,000 uh, light years behind that arm. It's not with the arm, the arm is in front of it. You see how it shadows it. So it's behind. That This is uh, one of the brightest interacting galaxy pairs that you can see. This galaxy itself is about 87,000 light years across, which is smaller than our own Milky Way. Our own Milky Way is about 100,000 uh, light years across. So this is a little smaller. It's at about 26 million light years away. So it's closer than the galaxies in the Virgo cluster, which are about 50 million light years away. So in a way, it is a neighbor of ours, not a close neighbor, but this is in the neighborhood of our own galaxy. So uh, as I said, the, the other one is about 40, uh, and, and NGC 5195, the one at the top is about 40,000 uh, light years across. And they uh, right now they are reclassifying it. It was called an irregular, and now they have found with the Hubble Space Telescope, they have found that it's a, uh, barred spiral, a small barred spiral. You notice like up and down it's got like a bar and it's got like uh, the uh, wings and the, uh, the arms on the side. So that's a barred spiral. So this is, th th this is right now very nicely visible and I thought I'd show it and describe it to you. Next one please. Ah, this is, the other one by the way was known as the Whirlpool Galaxy and this is the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is uh, NGC 5457 M101. It also is an ARP because it has that on the left, you notice a very heavy arm, what ARP describes as a very heavy arm. Now you notice here, the arms are much looser. This is more like a, an SB uh, rather than an SA, what they call. The classification here that these, as, as, the, uh, as the bulge gets smaller, the arms get sort of looser. This also is, this is an, uh, 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 this one, by the way, is bigger than the Milky Way. This one is 184,000 light years across, and it's about 21, uh, uh, 21 million light years away. So I would say, I would like to, to have this as a, as a challenge object. Uh, as the, uh, as the, it was pointed out, uh, uh, before uh, this is quite easy to find see me after the program and I'll tell you how to find both of these galaxies they're not that far apart from each other thanks thank you very much Paul. and our last one up for the evening here uh, is Brian McCullough with our lunar challenge
Okay, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, I went out on May 23rd with a new digital camera that I bought. It was just a little quick point and shoot. And uh, so my picture isn't crystal clear. I chopped off the bottom like this on purpose so that it would sit nicely on the screen without tipping over, all right? <laughs> that's, that's, my, that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. All right, so what we're doing is we're taking a, a walk along uh, the western shore of a waxing gibbous moon. Now, uh, in old texts, you'll find that what they've done with the moon, that they, you'll usually see it upside down. What we usually refer to the North Pole now is uh, you see Mare Chrysium that uh, Rolf was talking about here. Uh, there's a crater Copernicus that Paul Klonger was talking about. So this is north, that's east, and I'll show you the directions in a moment. Uh, but at this phase, now we've gone past sort of the first quarter moon. If it was just sort of half the moon, they call that first quarter. Now it's, the phase has advanced beyond that, so we're now into the waxing, or we're getting bigger, uh, gibbous moon. And what we want to do is just take a look along the shoreline. Chris, if you would, please. <clears throat> All right. Uh, is the focus a bit off on the uh, projector? It seems to be there. But anyway, so there's more or less the, uh, the directional lines. Now, uh, we're going to look at three, uh, three areas here. Uh, what we can look at uh, sinus iridum, and uh, a lot of people make the mistake of calling it sinus iridium, but it's not iridium, it's iridum, it's the Bay of Rainbows, right? And the distinctive crater Plato right here. And then we'll look down toward uh, the area uh, with Copernicus in it, but really we're going to be concentrating on some of the edge features as we go along, and then down to uh, Gassendi, and uh, here's Tycho down here. All right, we'll go to the next one, please. So up to the upper left, or the northwest part of our trip along the shore here, you've got the crater uh, Philolaus, which is about uh, just over 70 kilometers in diameter. Compare that with the one just below it, to the left, uh, J. Herschel, which is uh, about 156 kilometers in diameter, and we can just see the top edge of it here, the bottom edge of it here, but it's a, what they refer to as a disintegrated crater. All right? Uh, leading right past here is Mare Frigoris, or known as the, uh, the frozen sea, the frigid sea. All right, got the crater uh, Plato, just cutting across here, and we've got some nice mountain ranges here, but what I want to point out as we get along the shore here, uh, these promontories, the Promontorium Laplace and Heraclides, right here, this is what describes Sinus Iridum, or the Bay of Rainbows, and it's aptly named Bay of Rainbows because the larger impact basin here is the uh, Sea of Rains, Mare Imbrium. Uh, just down here, whoops, I'll try and hold my hand a bit steadier, uh, in 1970, that's where the Russian lander uh, uh, Lunacod, uh, what is it, yeah, Luna, Luna 17, sent out the Lunacod 1 rover. They lost contact with it eventually, and I think a couple of months ago, we talked about how it was just recently rediscovered because people didn't know what the exact position of it was. No, that was the other one. Oh, was it the other one? Oh, okay, sorry, okay. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, but this is where it uh, landed right here. But what's interesting, uh, this, this one is in the news just now because uh, they found a, a, the lunar uh, orbiter that's uh, going around the moon right now has identified its location. So what they've done is they've sent, uh, when the Apollo astronauts were on the moon, one of the experiments they left there was a, a, a laser ranging reflector. So these are uh, uh, corner reflectors so that when you shine a laser beam up to it and you hit the reflector, the reflection comes straight back down the line of your beam. So you collect that in a telescope. And uh, what they're able to do was send a laser beam now up to that uh, from, uh, from New Mexico and they got a nice return from there. And what they're doing is by, by doing the laser ranging, they can tell how far away the moon is. And they can see how is the moon behaving in space. So they can tell to now within millimeters of how far away uh, the moon is from us and how it behaves if it's uh, uh, creeping out, creeping in a bit, whatever it's doing during its uh, librations or as it rocks, uh, rocks along the way there. Okay, we'll go to the next one, please. So we're halfway along down here and this is where I've stuck a little bit of a lunar challenge in here. Uh, so we'll go to the large view here, and a uh, couple of uh, interesting things here. The one is there's a mountain peak just sitting out by itself, uh, Mons of Vinogradov, and it's about 25 kilometers across its base. So it's fairly distinctive, and you'll see the shadow of it when you're, uh, when you're observing it. Here's Copernicus that uh, Paul was talking about, and the mountain range that you saw right across, remember his picture was rotated 90 degrees to the right. He had north to the right. These are the Carpathian Mountains. 
right? They run about 400 kilometers long, and the massifs or the the mountains there are uh, are uh, around a kilometer or a bit a bit uh, a bit higher. So there's a nice line of craters you'll see as coming across if you're if you're observing. Uh, from the crater Archimedes up here, you get a nice line of craters going along right, right out here to Kepler, right? But there's also a nice line running from Copernicus, Copernicus down through Reinhold and uh, Landsberg, just down along this way. A uh, couple of things I wanted to point out. One is a Mare Cognitum. Now this is the known sea, right? And the reason they called it that was because in, uh, uh, when they put the, uh, uh, where am I here? Uh, Ranger, 7, Ranger 7 landed down in this mare, and it sent back the first detailed TV pictures of the lunar surface. So that's why they then called it, they referred to it as uh, the known sea. But along one edge of it here is this uh, about 125 kilometer long uh, Montes uh, Rephaeus, the, uh, the mountain range there. And uh, old Greek astronomers or geographers refer to that uh, Rephaeus as uh, the area where the north winds blew from. And what they were referring to on, uh, on Earth was the Ural Mountains uh, in, the old, uh, in the old Soviet Union. So we've got a couple of craters here, Kepler and Enki. So this is very interesting coming down along the shore here because now we're not seeing these things the way we, uh, the way, there's two of them right here, the way we normally do. So every time you get a, a slightly uh, changed phase on the moon, and as, a, as has already been said, it changes uh, even minute by minute. Right? If you're trying to see the cave on Copernicus, you've got a very narrow window for watching it as the lunar shadow progresses across the, uh, across the lunar surface. Uh, what's interesting here, so here's a close-up of the, those Kepler and Enki here, and uh, I'll show you what this is. This is getting down to uh, Gassendi. But this is what I want to show for the lunar challenge here. And I was very happy to see this in my photograph. And all I'll say as a clue, it's a bit of a, a harbinger of uh, greater things to come. But when you look at something like this, if you can imagine yourself, what would the view be like if you're standing on these peaks, these two peaks obviously catching the first rays of sunlight there, while the rest, the lower area here, is still in shadow. Imagine standing on that just the moment before the sunrise happens and then standing there and seeing some of the lunar surface laid out in front of you and then the sunrise catches your face. All right, let's go down to the next one, please. <clears throat> so we've just dropped down now to the crater Gassendi. Uh, I've, done, I've got sketches of some of these areas which I've shown uh, before. Uh, this is uh, what they call uh, Mare Humorum. I'll show it better here. All right, this is the, uh, the sea of uh, moisture here. All right, but what's uh, a couple of very interesting uh, things here. Well, I'm going to jump back up to this one now so we know the, uh, the sea of uh, moisture is right down here with just the walls of Gassendi. This is a very interesting area to explore uh, with a telescope. Uh, you can you can hang about there for uh, for for hours until your of course your shadow changes and then you've lost the exact view that you had, as I discovered when I made my sketch of Gassendi a, a few years ago, uh, as uh, Murray was saying, you know he started sketching one part and oh geez well maybe he'll add that oh and maybe you better include that. Well what I noticed was that in the hour and a half that I was doing the sketch, I did my initial sketch in about uh, 35 minutes, but then I thought oh well where to stop so I. I carried on doing a bit more over here, doing a bit more over here. And when I checked my sketch later against a, a reference photograph that I had taken at the beginning of the, of the observing run, I noticed that my photograph didn't show now what I was able to see uh, that I was putting in my sketches. All right, uh, very nice uh, area here. This is a beautiful area to, to discover. And uh, this crater here, which is now covered up, uh, got covered up when we shifted some of the labels here, but Bullialdus, uh, very nice because there's a, it's, it's, the walls of the crater jump right up, but there's a lot of splat, as Paul called it, coming down from there. So these, uh, it's a beautiful ray, a little uh, splat ray system coming down off it. All right, we've got the crater Capuanus, which I've uh, sketched before, right? And uh, Mercator and Campanus, just right here. But the, and here's Tycho, the one that sends the huge rays when you see it at full moon. A uh, very interesting object to observe is down here. It's a uh, Hainzel, and it's a complex crater because it's here's the main crater here, but it also has an A and a C component to it. And if you can get in there with a, uh, I was banging that camera around. I wasn't getting it lined up very properly, so you can see the way it's uh, a bit blurred. But through a telescope, 
you look at that and try and differentiate, well, where does the A part of that system end and where does, these are, these are craters that happen on top of craters. So you have the one impact and another one on the crater wall then another one on, that, on top of that. And in fact, in the southeastern part of the moon, there are some very interesting areas uh, like that as well. All right, we'll go to the next one, please. So there it is. So we've just taken a nice walk along, along the shore. Now today is a little bit of a special uh, day for me, and if I were to uh, take a, a walk along that shore with anybody, today it would be with my mom, uh, who died on this day one year ago, and that's my mommy right there on her wedding day in 1949. And that's uh, my grandma, my grandpa right there. And this is uh, her father, old grandpapa Champagne, and all the rest are her brothers and sisters. All right, and the only ones left now, uh, these two right here, Florent, Lucie, and uh, Fleurette right here. All right, I'll just leave you with that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, my notes are missing. Oh well, we'll fake it. It's on the screen anyway. Okay, good enough. Uh, we, uh, I guess, uh, we were recently contacted by the Toronto Centre, and I guess uh, I should I should recount for those of you who don't know the story. Uh, the David Dunlop Observatory was a uh, uh, originally set up in the Toronto area and over time uh, the light dome of the city has encroached. So the decision was made uh, some time ago that it wasn't useful for scientific work anymore. The observatory was uh, sold off to a developer but through, uh, through some efforts to preserve it the, uh, the development uh, skirted around the observatory itself and the observatory has been leased back to the Toronto Centre for doing uh, outreach activities. So it's uh, become quite active. We were contacted uh, a month or so ago uh, by the Toronto Centre to let us know that uh, the 75th anniversary of the observatory was coming up. So. Um, I, I, uh, I understand that we were a bit tardy in responding to this and we've actually missed the date for it, but nevertheless, just to let you know, uh, as, uh, as part of the material we were sent, uh, there was some mention of the center, uh, as it said here, I guess um, you could read, but at the opening ceremony for the David Dunlop Observatory on May 31st, 1935, Correspondence was read out from several well-known astronomical observatories and RESC centers, and the Ottawa Center was represented by Dr. Ralph Delury, then the first vice president of the society, and Clarence Hutchings. So uh, there, uh, the, while we continue to plan the 75th anniversary event, um, they're sending fresh correspondence again. They, uh, they uh, invited us to send up a birthday notice for the 75th anniversary. Unfortunately, we're a little late in that, so uh, uh, won't get there, but I think we'll still uh, send our greetings from the center, if, if uh, nothing else, a little belated. So uh, just good to know that that uh, historic facility is still up and running in a new role and uh, reaching out to new people and introducing new folks to the hobby the interest. Next please. Okay, uh, star party coming up for our center Friday, June 11th. It'll be at the Carp li uh, Library or where the Defen Bunker is. If you uh, get there around uh, 6, 6.30 and head on in the gate, I think you'll have no trouble finding uh, the star party uh, down and to the left if I remember correctly. I forgot to put on that slide, but uh, if Tim were right and there might be some clouds that Friday night the, uh, and rain, the alternate is the next day, Saturday. That's right. So uh, if Friday the 11th looks bad, try for Saturday. If Saturday looks better, that'll be the night. Next, please. Okay, uh, post-meeting entertainment as usual. Uh, Estelle is here. Uh, Yes, okay, so the book library will be open. Uh, Al is here, so I imagine the equipment library is also open. Uh, Art and Ann Fraser will be providing the coffee and refreshments. Membership info, you can speak to Art Fraser. 
Uh, membership cards, uh, Art will have them if yours is due to be back. Uh, It'll be out there. A uh, reminder, the rest of the museum is closed, so please stay to the <coughs> entry area, the foyer. And uh, the usual reservation has been made at Kelsey's, so uh, you can join the group there if you like. Uh, tonight's audience was 125 people. Uh, thanks to all of the speakers and people who helped out with the meeting tonight. Thanks to our host, the Canadian Science and Technology Museum. And uh, any complaints, comments, or uh, suggestions for improvements in the agenda or the material being presented, please get hold of me at bill.wagstaff at rogers.com. Next meeting uh, will be on July 9th. I remind you that is not the first Friday of next month. It's the second Friday because, of course, the, uh, the first one is adjacent to the holiday weekend. Okay. Uh, other than that... Any ideas for observations or other talks, uh, please get hold of me again at the same email address. Thank you and good evening.